As a show of hands, how many of you read something about quantum computing in the news in the last uh, month? OK, most of you. Uh, makes sense. Um, you may have heard about the National Quantum Initiative, NQ the NQI, which was signed into law uh, in December of previous year. It's $1.2 billion with the B. Um, in the US only, and other countries are investing hugely also. So let me quickly go over the main points of the NQI. And uh, more details are available in the science paper by uh, Chris Monroe and other people. Chris Monroe was my former colleague at the University of Michigan, but he's running a center at Maryland and uh, a startup, IMQ, that is one of the leading um, companies in quantum computing. So, the NQI in the US is presented in three pillars. Uh, quantum computing, which is mostly simulating quantum mechanics and using non-quantum um, applications, solving non-quantum problems. Quantum communications, which focus on secure communications via quantum key distribution, and also entanglement networks, which connect uh, quantum states remotely through uh, either optical networks or satellites. And the third, Pillar is uh, quantum sensing and metrology. For example, atomic clocks are super precise instruments. And um, quantum communications, as well as quantum sensing, are pretty much success stories, right? Um, except that the market size seems somewhat limited. Um, it's not clear how many people or banks or military organizations need to communicate through satellites or optical fibers with quantum key distribution. Some do. Um, and also, the precision in atomic clocks, aside from the GPS system, it's not clear how many applications need that astronomic precision. Quantum computing seems like the most interesting application. And Chris Monroe and other people in, the, in this paper, they're mostly quantum computing people. right? So we'll talk about quantum computing, but it's much harder to make it useful. Now, the main difference in quantum computing from conventional computing, aside from the hardware, is the model of computation. And there are actually quite a few different models of quantum computation. But once you uh, write algorithms in one of these models of computation, there are certain expectations and promises right, on which uh, the entire field is built. So to just be clear, to avoid the hype, let me give you the fine print right away. First of all, quantum computing does not promise new decision powers. Whatever is decidable in conventional computing is decidable in quantum and vice versa. That's actually very good. Otherwise, it would be very confusing and strange. Now, there is really no claim to solve NP hard problems exactly in polynomial time on a quantum computer. That's a common misconception in, in the media. And moreover, there is no asymptotic speed up for some basic problems such as sorting on a quantum computer, which means that there is no universal asymptotic speed. In fact, it's hard to find quantum algorithms that give you a speed up, or hard to find problems on which quantum um, algorithms uh, promise a speed up. For sorting, it's a theorem that there is no hope, so no one is really looking. Right. Also, the individual quantum gates, or whatever devices you use, don't promise speed up. So the promise is really in special purpose um, you know, algorithms and special purpose hardware. And there are quite a few, there, there are some number of algorithms, but not many of them that are you know, killer apps. So you could look at this as a glass half full or glass half empty situation, uh, but you know, this is roughly what it is. Now, so far we talked about error-free quantum algorithms. Um, it turns out once you start building hardware, Errors in quantum hardware are inherent, and there are a lot of them. And so compared to conventional computers, which also went through 20, 30 years um, of you know, having high error rates in hardware, things are fundamentally worse for quantum computing. And many people don't realize this. Now, entangled states, whatever they are, but they're required for, to, to achieve the power of quantum computation, they globalize noise and errors. What does this mean? It means if you have an error in one gate or in one qubit, uh, if the overall state of your quantum computer is entangled, this error affects the entire state. In my laptop, if you know, a particular memory bit or a CPU gate experience uh, a particle strike and has a glitch, this glitch will likely go away. 
for two reasons. First of all, it doesn't affect the entire system immediately. And second, there are three kinds of masking, logical, uh, electrical, uh, and temporal masking in conventional circuits. I spent a lot of my time working on hardware uh, electronics. Um, but for quantum computers, these masking types, mas masking uh, mechanisms don't work, right? So things are quite a bit worse. Now, errors accumulate multiplicatively in quantum circuits. So if you have 500 gates with 0.5% fidelity, which is common for uh, implementations today, the circuit fidelity of the entire computation is dismal, right? And we have to keep this in mind, right? So um, you have to use error correction to achieve scalability, but the qubit budgets available now don't allow that, right? So right now we are stuck with quantum computers that are noisy, intermediate scale quantum computers, right? Individual gates are somewhat reliable, but if you have you know, hundreds of them, then the fidelity is very low, okay? And to make things worse, conventional error correction, which is done by repetition, um, and other conventional codes don't work in the quantum case because copying is, is a very difficult operation, okay? So quantum error correction has much greater overhead. Now, if you're trying to beat conventional computers with quantum computers, then, you know, if you read too much news, you have a wrong impression. You, it's a numbers game. You have to compare carefully. You have to find the applications, and you have to uh, look carefully for the speed up and then somehow validate. So you need to also account for the advantages of conventional computers, which I will not go over, but there are quite a few. Um, the gates and the wires have a lot of serious advantages at large scale. Um, there are advantages at the hardware system level, um, including many different components, but also the design and verification methodologies, which are fundamentally harder for um, quantum computers. And then at the level of software, uh, you have programmability and you know, universal computation, uh, which aren't really as expected, at least not universal speed up for quantum computing. Okay? And I have this nature paper from a couple of years ago that itemizes uh, a lot of these considerations. Now, coming to the title of my talk, if you look at the amount of money that is being poured in quantum computing startups at quantum research, you know, $1.2 billion in the US alone over some number of years, it sounds like a gold rush. And the you know, proposals sent to the National Science Foundation, a lot of them remind those you know, people with very primitive instruments and kind of shallow understanding, but they're hoping to dig some gold. Uh, it's, really more like a treasure hunt because uh, the speed ups are rare and you have to find them and it's very hard to ascertain that you actually found something. So today we're gonna go into some more detail on how these speed ups um, you know, are pursued and really the goal, the treasure, um, is to demonstrate an end-to-end -end advantage over highly optimized classical systems and then verify that the results are correct. Okay, these are very challenging goals. Now, uh, what we have uh, in terms of hardware is noise intermediate scale um, quantum computing, and you have a dilemma in choosing the application. Either you take known computational problems with inputs relevant to applications and try to you know, beat these on conventional computers, but then you have really good software and hardware um, available, and it's just you know, not something that a lot of people pursue these days, um, especially that quantum hardware doesn't process big data for various reasons. So uh, the other choice is to take emerging and made up artificial problems and have inputs that are as contrived as you want to emphasize the benefits of quantum computing. And this is really the approach that has been pursued uh, with the goal to establish quantum computational supremacy. So if you, if you um, saw the announcement from Google uh, as of last month, uh, that's what they claimed, and I'll talk about this specifically, okay? But in all these cases, it's not a fixed milestone that you're establishing because conventional hardware and conventional algorithms are rapidly improving, okay? So it's gonna be basically a moving target, okay? Now, to demonstrate the difficulties of the first approach, let me show a couple of papers. So one of them was from quite a while ago, uh, based on my simulation result. 
It turns out the quantum fast Fourier transform, which is part of Shor's number factoring algorithm, can be classically assimilated. This was a big shock because it was thought that it's key to quantum speedups. Uh, however, quantum simulation is not composable in the sense that for Shor's algorithm, the module exponentiation part, the main bottleneck, and the quantum Fourier transform each can be simulated classically, but when you combine them, the result cannot be simulated classically. Okay. Much more recent stream of work by Evan Tang, who was an undergraduate at MIT. Uh, she dequantized a number of algorithms that were pitched for machine learning, such as quantum PCA and uh, solving systems of linear equations. Basically, she really covered a bunch of linear algebra that was pitched for speedups, and uh, she showed that there are dequantized conventional algorithms that solve, that basically mimic quantum algorithms on matrices of low rank. Now, the quantum algorithms still hold some promise for matrices of high rank, but in practice, often the matrices have low rank. Also, there was this ancient paper uh, that my student and I and the uh, co-author at Michigan wrote uh, about quantum search. If you've heard about the quantum database search, uh, there is no database in the usual sense. It's actually very hard to apply quantum search to something practical, and I don't think anyone is really trying. People realize this. Okay, so, now, the second line of work has been much more productive, and uh, there are these two papers uh, from Nature Physics. The first one is from Google um, that establishes a problem, made up artificial problem that I will cover, uh, that was pitched for quantum computational supremacy. The next paper from Berkeley proved theoretically that this problem is very hard to solve um, conventionally, both in the worst case and in the average case, which is a much more practical result. And the third paper just came out you know, recently in Nature from Google, and that generated a lot of um, controversy and uh, excitement. They claim that they established quantum supremacy using 53 qubits. Their device had 54, but one didn't work. Okay? Um, so now, there are a couple of slides that are fairly technical, um, but they will give you a sense of what kind of problems they're solving on the quantum computer. The input to the problem is a description of a quantum circuit. Okay? It's not something practical. It's not a picture. It's not uh, you know, a sound. It's a sequence of gates. Uh, it's really closer to an assembly program because quantum circuits, the way they look, they operate in qubits referred by numbers. So you might, might have this gate that applies to qubits 3 and 5, another gate to qubit 7, and so on. Okay? Simple assembly program. And um, the output is whatever the quantum computer produces. Now, the quantum computer uh, internally computes a huge vector. So think about 2 to the 64 or 2 to the 54 um, complex uh, values that you cannot really save. But you're not allowed to look at all of those values at the same time. You can only look at, say, one or one sum of different values. You could say, I want to query uh, the value number 35 or the value number 5 million. And as you do that, the state just gets destroyed. So you have to repeat the computation many times. Now, what this tells you is that the problems for which quantum computers naturally have an advantage over conventional computers um, are problems where the output distribution is, is the result. Not the distribution itself, but samples out of this distribution, right? And the hardness results are proven, this was the Berkeley paper, uh, so they've proven that uh, whatever you do conventionally, it's a very general proof, uh, whatever you do conventionally would take basically very long time, uh, asymptotically. They didn't care much about constants, both in the worst case and in the average case. Okay? They've also proven that if you approximate the result, if a small amount of error is allowed, then it's still hard. Okay? Most results are much simpler, just worst case exact computation. And the last point about this problem is that it has imminent availability, and now actual availability, on quantum computers because the gates can be arranged on a grid, exactly how they're built in, in um, superconducting chips. Okay, so if you want a, a visual image of sampling from a distribution, think of darts that are just thrown at random, and you know, hopefully the distribution has some peaks somewhere. That's really the type of distribution that um, you're getting. Now, um, a very subtle point that most quantum computing experts don't quite understand, 95% of experts don't understand it, um, is 
how many samples do you actually need? And also, if you have a conventional simulation of your quantum process, of your quantum circuit, how many amplitudes do you need to produce, right? Conventional simulators of quantum circuits typically write out the entire vector. But for a large quantum circuit, that's hopeless. This was assumed two years ago as you know, a main ro roadblock uh, for simulation. And people thought, well, if you simulate, you compute the entire vector. 2 to the 54 or 64, you cannot save it, so you cannot simulate. This was wrong. And it was known to be wrong in, in, in the literature. But the question of how many amplitudes can you produce, do you need to produce, that's a subtle question that was addressed in um, my paper joint with Google. There's an archive reference at the bottom. Basically, there are different kinds of sampling. You know, uh, and we've shown that to simulate one output of a quantum computer, it's enough to produce only 10 amplitudes. Think of them as uh, complex or even real values. Okay? It's a pretty significant simplification. And we also have an algorithm that produces multiple of these values. So in one run of the simulator, we can mimic many runs of a quantum computer. Okay? This is important not only because of the competition with quantum computers, but also for verification. You need to know that the result is correct. So there is a whole bunch of reasons to do simulation. And the work um, I report here is really on simulating quantum computers, but also using the simulation for various tasks uh, to assist in the development of new algorithms in verification and so on. And I'll uh, mention at the end of the talk a couple of connections to ML algorithms. OK. So um, not telling you anything about the simulation algorithm, let me show you some results. So the first uh, set of results is really uh, the, kind of the price of admission, right? To, to be in this field, you need to show that you can compete with software from IBM and from Microsoft, OK? Um, and these results are one year old, but I don't think anyone improved them since then. We haven't released the code. Um, you see that we are much faster than IBM QuizKit, um, you know, 10 uh, times eight times we use less memory. But in quantum computing, you know, five or 10 times is nothing. You really need to be, uh, you know, asymptotically faster or speed ups, given speed ups that are hundreds of times. Okay. The next target is this result from um, just two years ago. There was a very famous paper, generated a lot of publicity, simulating a 45 qubit circuit on a supercomputer with 0 0.5 petabyte memory, petabytes of memory. And the claim was, this is how much memory, this is the resources that you need to um, use for 45 qubits. OK? Now, turns out, and this takes a leap of faith, you don't need a supercomputer to simulate that. We've simulated pretty much the same circuits, 5 by 9 uh, grid, um, 642 gates, depth 26, saving a large enough number of amplitudes on a single server using just 17.5 gigabytes of memory. Um, and we did this in the cloud. We didn't use a supercomputer. So in the cloud, you can price the resources. This uh, would cost um, basically a quarter last year. And this year, it's going to be cheaper because prices go down and hardware improves. OK, um, now, to scale it up, we need to recall that quantum computers, at least the current ones, are like leaky faucets. They leak information as the computation progresses. So you don't get a, an exact result. And if your simulator, which is how most simulators work today, is exact, it's doing too much work. Okay? So we figured out um, how to perform approximate simulation where the accuracy is tuned. The idea is that whatever your quantum computer, whatever errors it experiences, whatever instabilities in the gates it experiences, we can tune our simulator to have more errors and to run faster and be more precise just a little bit than your quantum computer. Okay? So it's really a race to the bottom, quote unquote. Now, um, here are the results from our paper. These are 7x7 seven seven and 7x8 seven circuits from Google that were designed to be hard to simulate. These are the hardest circuits to simulate on a conventional computer. And without going too far um, here, I'll just say this is a cloud simulation. It uses a number of uh, you know, uh, instances available to anyone. Again, this was from last year. Uh, so these are N1 HIMEM 32 instances with 32 cores. And uh, the cost here in dollars would be $35,000 for a 56 qubit uh, simulation of depth 40 plus uh, 2. 
So there are two special rounds of gates at the beginning and the end. Okay. Uh, initially, Google planned these circuits to establish quantum supremacy, but they had to change their plans. So the reaction from Google to our work was uh, that you know they needed to go deeper, and uh, they made the benchmarks harder, but still feasible for quantum computers. So first of all, they changed some gates uh, to be much harder to simulate. Right. Uh, the algorithms are exponential in nature for simulation. So the branching factor uh, changed from two to four. You can imagine, you know, this this uh, basically causes a huge speed, a slowdown in simulation. They also apply more gates in parallel, but we can handle this. Some other simulators can't, and they also reordered gates to complicate simulation. We can also handle this. The, the hard part is the gates that they use. Now, no one is claiming that those gates they use are more useful than the gates that we can simulate, but this allowed them to establish quantum supremacy, namely a computation that is quickly doable on a quantum computer. I think they used a few hundred seconds, and they claimed that uh, it would take uh, 10,000 days, I think, uh, on a conventional, on, on a supercomputer, not just any computer. So within a few weeks, IBM came out with a claim that you know, they know how to do this in two and a half days, but only if they use a huge amount of memory, so they haven't actually implemented this, right? That's the controversy. And, uh, you know, before I wrap up my talk, I wanted to give a couple of comments on where QC, quantum computing, um, can meet um, machine learning. So the very first thing that you would have to see is to reliably show what I would call strong quantum supremacy. Namely, quantum supremacy that is not subject to all the fine print in the current experiments, right? The gates that are actually beneficial more than the previous, uh, more than gates that you can simulate, you know, circuits that do something that can be used. Now, maybe you can take this problem from Google and find some use for it. That would be great. But someone needs to uh, establish strong quantum supremacy. And once you do that, then the next challenge becomes how to process large amounts of data on a quantum computer. Large meaning you know, more than a few hundred or a few thousand floats. So if you look at science or nature papers uh, from various places that discuss mul uh, machine learning applications for quantum computers, they typically all suffer from this problem. Okay? Now, um, there are f physicists who work on uh, quantum memories. This could help, but this is very far out still. Now, um, another issue is in algorithms, and this is you know something that you can work with, with the, work on with a pencil and the paper. Uh, it turns out many uh, machine learning algorithms proposed for quantum um, computers and from you know machine learning problems, they have been dequantized. Essentially, it's it's a simulation technique, right, where you don't simulate the gate by gate, but you take the blocks of the algorithms or mimic the algorithms using conventional algorithms. Okay, and this is a great challenge. I think a lot of progress can be made here. And the, the last thing is that most uh, people working in the field and most people not working in the field underestimate the importance of quantum simulation. Quantum simulation helps in design, right? Uh, and for example, you can download uh, from Microsoft extensions to the Visual Studio that supports their Q Sharp language. You could write quantum programs in Visual Studio and simulate them on Azure. The announcement was just made recently. So they support simulation very well. Um, and if you have a quantum computer, how do you know that it works correctly? You need simulation to verify a quantum computer, but also if the simulation uh, that you have is really good, then it competes with quantum computers, right? And uh, this is where I end, just the punchline. It's a treasure hunt, not a gold rush, and the comma is very important. Thank you.